The discrete Fourier transform is a very powerful and widely used tool in signal processing. In this video, we're going to introduce the discrete Fourier transform and we'll interpret the DFT as a way of representing discrete time signals using complex sinusoidal building blocks. We'll look at a couple important properties and then discuss the fast Fourier transform algorithm for computing the DFT. So the DFT assumes that we have a discrete time signal, which is finite duration. So we're going to represent that by assuming that we have samples from n equals 0, 1, 2, up through capital N minus 1. And we represent x of n as a weighted sum of complex sinusoids. This is very similar to a Fourier series. You notice that our weights are 1 over n times uppercase x of k, and this is the weight that's applied to frequency k over n. Now the complex sinusoids are of frequency k over n cycles per sample, and we're going to let the frequencies range from 0 to n minus 1 divided by n. Now x of k are the spectrum of the discrete time signal. And you can see that we are writing x of n in terms of the spectrum, or in terms of its coefficients at each frequency, by expanding out this sum. So we have 1 over n, capital X of 0, e to the j 0 times n, or that's just going to be 1. So this is a 0 frequency term. When k is equal to 1, I have a complex sinusoid whose frequency is 1 over capital N cycles per second. When k is equal to 2, I have a complex sinusoid whose frequency is 2 over capital N cycles per second, and so on, all the way up to capital N minus 1 divided by N cycles per second. So these frequencies are harmonics or integer multiples of 1 over N cycles per sample. Now we can find these coefficients or weights x of k from the time series x of n using this formula called the discrete Fourier transform of x of n. And that is that x at k is equal to the sum from n equals 0 to capital N minus 1 of x of n times e to the minus j 2 pi k over n times lowercase n. So these two relationships that we have on this slide, one expressing x of k as a function of x of n, and the other expressing x of n as a function of x of k, they're a pair. I can take x of n and find x of k, or given x of k, I can find x of n. Now there are only capital N sinusoids involved in this representation, and this is because discrete time sinusoids with frequencies that are shifted by one cycle per sample are identical. A sinusoid with frequency k over n, and we've added capital N over n, in other words, k over n plus one, and if you distribute the 2 pi and the lowercase n over these parentheses and separate out the components of the exponential, you have e to the j 2 pi k over capital N times n times e to the j 2 pi n, which is always 1. So there's only capital N unique frequencies that are integer multiples of 1 over n. Whereas in a Fourier series, which represents continuous time signals, you have an infinite number of terms because continuous time sinusoids with distinct frequencies are always distinct. Now you notice that in both of those expressions for involving the DFT, the sums have a finite number of terms in them. Hence, the DFT is ideally suited for computation and that it's widely used everywhere. I mean, it's used to get the spectrum, but it's used in a lot of other places as well. It's used in global positioning systems, in MP3, in JPEG, uh, Wi-Fi. There's a very, very long list of places where the DFT is actually used. So let's look at an example. If I'm given a time signal x of n with is 1 half when n is equal to 0, 1, and 0 when n is equal to 2, 3 through 9, First of all, that capital N is equal to 10. Therefore, I can write my expression for x of k as a sum from n equals 0 to 9, x of n, e to the minus j 2 pi k divided by n times little n. Since there's only two values of x of n that are non-zero in this case, I can write this each of those out as 1 half e to the minus j 2 pi k over 10 times 0. That's the n equals 0 term plus 1 half e to the minus j 2 pi k over 10 times 1. The complex exponential raised to the 0th power is exactly 1. 
So this becomes 1 half plus 1 half e to the minus j 2 pi k over 10. And I can simplify this by factoring out half of this exponential. Now the reason that I want to do that is because then the terms that are left will look like a cosine. I can write e to the minus j pi k over 10 times the quantity e to the j pi k over 10. The other term will be e to the minus j pi k over 10. And of course that is equal to e to the minus j pi k over 10 times cosine of pi k over 10. And I've sketched what's called the magnitude spectrum, which is the magnitude of x of k. And you can see that when k is equal to 0, we have 1. And then when k is equal to 5, we have cosine of pi over 2, which will be 0. And from 5 to 9, the values are going to increase proportional to a cosine. Now we did this example by hand just to show how the formula is applied, but in practice it's used with a computer actually doing the computation. Now the DFT has a couple important properties that are going to play a role in our interpretation of it. X of minus k is equal to X of capital N minus k, and that's for k equals 0 through N minus 1. Frequency minus k is the same as frequency N minus k. Now for purposes of computation, we almost always use x of k with k going from 0 to n minus 1. However, if we want to display the spectrum, then we're going to want to use x of k symmetric about 0. And so if n is odd, then we're going to use indices k going from minus quantity n minus 1 over 2 up through n minus 1 over 2. And if n is even, we'd start with negative n over 2 plus 1 all the way up to n over 2. If I take x of k, this upper half is the same as the negative frequencies from minus 1 to negative n minus 1 over 2. So the DFT coefficient at minus 1 is identical to the DFT coefficient at n minus 1. The DFT coefficient at n minus 2 and minus 2 are identical. And similarly, at n minus 1 divided by 2 and negative n minus 1 divided by 2. So if we compute the DFT from 0 to n minus 1, all we have to do is take these values in the upper half and put them at negative frequency, and then we can use that to display the spectrum in a way that's more intuitive. Now one other property is that x of minus k is equal to x conjugate of positive k. So the spectrum of DFT coefficients has conjugate symmetry. The values at negative frequencies are the conjugates of those at positive frequencies. So this implies that the magnitude spectrum x of k is an even function of k. It also implies that the magnitude spectrum at x of k is the same as the magnitude spectrum at x of n minus k. So this first portion of the magnitude spectrum is identical to the magnitude spectrum from n minus 1 over 2 up to n minus 1. And this latter property holds whenever x of n is real. So we're going to do another example. We're going to do part of this example by hand, and then we're going to resort to the computer. We're going to consider x of n to be 2 times cosine of frequency 11 over 40 cycles per sample. And we'll assume that we have n equals 0 through 19. We want to find the DFT coefficients x of k. Since we have n equals 0 through 19, that means capital N is 20. And so my expression for the DFT coefficients is a sum. And then what I've done here is taken x of n and substituted 2 cosine of 2 pi 11 over 40 times n, where I've expanded the cosine using the Euler representation, and multiply the e to the minus j 2 pi k over 20 n times both of these terms. So I'm going to start with the 11 over 40 cycles per second term. That and we'll look at how we find the component of x of k associated with that term. And it's almost identical to find the component associated with minus 11 over 40 cycles per second. Combine the two exponents, and we'll have e to the j 2 pi 11 over 40 times n minus k over 20 times n. And now I can write this as this term in parentheses, e to the j 2 pi times the quantity 11 over 40 minus k over 20, raised to the nth power. 
And I'm writing it this way because this allows us to use a formula for a geometric series to find the sum in closed form. Finite geometric series, the sum from L equals 0 to capital L minus 1 of alpha to the raised to the L, is 1 minus alpha to the capital L divided by 1 minus alpha. And this applies whenever alpha is not equal to 1. Apply this formula using alpha to be this term in parentheses. I have 1 minus e to the j 2 pi 11 over 40 minus k over 20 quantity times 20 divided by 1 minus e to the j 2 pi 11 over 40 minus k over 20. You get a similar result when you use the minus 11 over 40 term. Well, we're going to stop at this point and resort to the computer to finish this for us. I've plotted the magnitude spectrum. It's dominated by components in the k equals 5 and 6 range, as well as the 14 and 15 range. Why is it that we have the largest energy here, but we have components at all frequencies? The answer is to think about what we're doing with the discrete Fourier transform. We're trying to represent x of n in terms of complex sinusoids whose frequencies are k over capital N. In this case, it's integer multiples of 1 over 20 cycle per second. So we have the frequency of our discrete time sinusoid is 11 over 40. And we're trying to represent that using sinusoids that are integer multiples of 1 over 20. Now, 11 over 40 is not an integer multiple of 1 over 20. So we actually need all of the possible frequencies to represent this one. 11 over 40 is actually in between 5 over 20 and 6 over 20. And that's why we have the largest values near 5 over 20 and 6 over 20. The sinusoid that we're trying to represent is closest to those frequencies. Now let's look at a very closely related problem. Suppose I change the frequency of the cosine from 11 over 40 to 10 over 40. In other words, x of n is 2 cosine 2 pi times 10 over 40 times n. Well, 10 over 40 is 1 fourth, which is exactly equal to 5 times 1 over 20. The frequency of the sinusoid that I'm trying to represent is an integer multiple of 1 over 20, the fundamental frequency when capital N is 20. In fact, I can expand x of n using the Euler representation and write it as e to the j 2 pi times 5 over 20 times n plus e to the minus j 2 pi times 5 over 20 times n. And if I look at this, you'd say, well, I have one component that corresponds to k equals 5 and another DFT component that corresponds to k equals minus 5. So this should only be two non-zero terms. And it turns out that if you calculate the DFT coefficients, you find that there are two non-zero values in the spectrum, one at k equals 5 and the other at k equals 15, which is the same as k equals minus 5. Because remember, we have a property which said that x of minus k is the same as x of n minus k. I can exactly represent this cosine using only two components. So if the frequency of the cosine is included in the set that's used to represent the cosine, like we have in this case, there's going to be two components for each cosine. If, on the other hand, the frequency of the cosine is not included in the set that's being used to represent the signal, such as in the previous page where we had 11 over 40 as the frequency and we're using integer multiples of 1 over 20, there's going to be all of the capital N DFT coefficients in general are going to be non-zero. So the DFT is typically computed using an algorithm that's called a fast Fourier transform algorithm. And the algorithm takes that sum and it divides it up into terms that can be computed more efficiently. The term fast Fourier transform only means an algorithm for computing the discrete Fourier transform. The quantity that's being computed is the discrete Fourier transform. The way that it's being computed is using a fast Fourier transform algorithm. This particular algorithm for computing the DEFT was rediscovered by Cooley and Tukey in 1965. There's evidence actually that Gauss discovered it originally. Now the cost of doing 
an FFT algorithm is proportional to n times log base 2 of n. If you look at computing this sum to get all capital N coefficients of the DFT, you'd need n squared operations to do it directly. As n grows to be large, this makes a very, very big difference. And given the computational capabilities that were available in the 60s and 70s, this algorithm actually had a very, very important role in spurring the growth of signal processing as a field and its applications to solving important problems.